my subject, I would call it the greatest of all blessings. But like all things in Scripture, they are on level. If I could take it on this level, if I took it on this level, then tell a little story to illustrate it. But the greatest of all blessings would be a strong imagination, a clear idea, and a determined vision of things as we desire them to be, all clearly fixed in our mind, and never waver from that vision. Regardless of what you hear, regardless of what rumor comes into your world, just a good strong imagination, a clear idea, and a determined vision of things as you would like them to be, which would imply the fulfillment of a dream, your dream, on this level. That same formula holds good for us on the highest level. In detail in the divine mind. And his dream for us is never to make man in our image. And that has never faltered, never wavered. It still remains fixed in the divine mind. Regardless of what we go through in this world, that remains fixed. So that must come out. You and I, on this level, we may wake up and break the image and feel that the law doesn't work. But on the highest level for us, there is no way God is faithful. You can trust him invisibly to produce in us the image, which is the image of himself. Let us make man in our image. On this level, let me show you in a simple way how this law operates. I received a letter yesterday from a friend who was here tonight. Another friend who also is here tonight shared with us an experience of his. He did it with remarkable success, fantastic success. He took many, but he tells us of a few that he had assumed the personality of that other and then while he wore that personality, he simply gave to himself as that being. What that being could not give to self. So this is gentleman here tonight. He says, I pay God. I don't pay well, but I pay God for case. And so a friend of mine said to me, one with whom I play time and again, what about a game tomorrow? And I accepted the invitation. So that night the night before the game, I assumed I was my friend. I entered his body. And then wearing the body of my friend, so that we'll wait for you, come right up here. And assuming the body of the friend, he then complimented himself on every stroke on the game that he played. So he played the part of his opponent, complimenting himself on the game that he played. The next day, I would say, first of all, he said, we're not the best players, we only play nine holes, and we almost come, I would say, equal. We do it to 56 or 57 strokes. That is our score for nine holes. So he said, the next day we played, and it was sheer fantasy. Everything just went right to me. At the end of the game, I won by ten strokes. And he, at every hole, was complimented. He said, my puppy was simply amazing. Everything, as I've never done it before, and we could 
But he said, no, well, I didn't intend to beat him. That was not the purpose. But I tell you this to show you how it all works. I wonder if Arnold Palmer knows about it. <laughs> Undoubtedly, he does. If he puts himself into the body of Nick Brown and has Jack compliment him on every hole, then who is going to win? I just say, this is how the law works. A strong imagination, a clear idea, and a determinate vision of things as you want them to be. And do not waver in that state. And this is how the law works in this world of ours. God on the higher level holds us, holds everyone in his mind's eye, to form everyone into the image of himself, and that image is Jesus Christ. Now I asked you a few weeks ago to assume, as you'll be tired of time, if you are Jesus Christ. I had a purpose for it. Just assume I am Jesus Christ. For well, if that is the root, then you will grow from that root. All things bring forth after their kind. Well, a few hardy souls have the courage to find. Well, I can tell you, my children, I that from this small audience, three men, two are present tonight, one is not, but he was here last Tuesday. On the basis of this assumption, wrote me these letters. Now here is the question. This chapter assumes I am Jesus Christ. And try to feel what it would be like would he Jesus Christ. And follow him. And he found himself sitting at a long table with benches to see just as he would in a park the picnic ground. And two first cousins were present. This lad, like his cousins, were all born and raised in the Catholic faith. They could not claim today that they are practicing Catholics, but they were born and raised in that faith. A discussion started, and my friend tried to persuade them of the reality of the power and the wisdom of God. And tell them that the power and the wisdom of God was spirit. And they seemed to be shocked when he told them what he did about the power and the wisdom of God. He said, I am not making this up. I will show it to you in scripture. This was written by Paul 2,000 years ago. This is all in his dream. He's talking this way. And he tried to find a New Testament where he could Turn to the first chapter of the first epistle of Corinthians, which is the 24th verse, to read this passage. And then he says, before finding the Bible, he says, in the scripture written 2,000 years ago, the power and the wisdom of God was named Jesus Christ. And with that, it was a disheartening statement that the whole dream vanished. They vanished, he awoke from it all, and he remembered what he had read. But may I tell you, the whole purpose of life, if by God's law you own the earth, and many have tried to own the earth, great tyrants the world over, over the centuries have tried to own this earth, they've all failed. But if you did succeed in owning the earth, you'll make your exit anyway, like the little grass that withers and the flower that falls. Everything goes that way. But if you only fulfill scripture, or the purpose of life is to fulfill scripture, that I have come, and my only purpose is to fulfill scripture. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. As you read it in the 24th chapter, of the book of Luke, 
And he began with Moses, and then the prophets, and then the Psalms, and he interpreted to all of them, all that was said of him in Scripture. So Jesus Christ, in man, has been formed, as he's been formed, he unfolds Scripture. So here is my friend who acts it in a state that you would call an involuntary state. He is quoting Scripture. He is quoting the 24th verse of the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. He is unfolding Scripture within himself by first assuming, I am Jesus Christ. Now another one writes the letter, and he says, I assume I am Jesus Christ. And I found myself walking down a highway, moving towards an institution for men. I knew there were all men there, and they needed my help. And that was the purpose of my journey. I was going to help them. So as I went down towards this place, I entered the courtyard of the institution, and instantly an enormous dog jumped at me. And I held him, as I put my right hand forward, it went through the car and in some way held him, and therefore arrested his motion, so he did not really hurt. And then, as I held him, all he could do was to be just nuzzle my little, my neck. So it perfectly harmless. But I saw men in the area, and I knew intuitively that these men had planned <laughs> this trip. And they were enjoying the little trip of this seemingly vicious soul. All that I had in his emotion was compassion for them. That's all that I had. Just compassion. And then I had no resentment, I had no feeling of hurt, just sheer compassion for these men who had plotted and planned this trip against me. Then I turned my back on the men and I repeated the 11th verse of the 13th chapter of First Corinthians. And this is the verse. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. I reasoned as a child. When I became a man, I put childish things away. And then I wrote. Here is scripture. Fulfilling scripture in the unfolding self. I say to him, he has a part ago. It always strikes me in a very strange way that everyone across this country as I go, they're always quoting the words of Paul. And the soul begins to unfold. There are only two more verses left. And the next really links it with the last. The next verse, now, we see through a last darkness. Or as one translation has it, we see in a mirror. Dim. But then, face to face. That's the twelfth verse. And then we come into the 13th, which I know from experience. When you stand face to face with the risen Christ, you pronounce the last word. And it is so love, or rather faith, hope, and love. These three arise. But the greatest of these is love. So the next vision comes when you are brought into the presence of the risen Christ, a man. And when you answer by quoting the last verse of 13 Corinthians, he embraces you. As he embraces you, you are fused with the body of Christ. You are incorporated into the body of Christ. You are one with the body of Christ and one with the spirit of Christ. Then you are sent into this world to tell the story of the risen Christ. So here, this chap, by daring to assume, I am Christ, and he found at the position 
is the moving drop of where he is in the unfolding self. What you are in the world of Sita does be in Adam. He may be tonight completely unknown even in his neighborhood. He may have no security in the world of Sita. He may be almost tongue-tied among people. That's entirely up to him or others. It doesn't really matter. But in the world of God, the unfolding soul, there he stands the end of this wonderful drama as recorded in Corinthians. He's on the verge. He's only a verse away from it because the 12th and the 13th, they come together. Now I see in a mirror in the thing face to face. And that comes right. Face to face comes with the answer, which is the greatest of these is done. As though you are completely your what to say when you ask what is the greatest thing in the world. Now scripture also tells the symbolism, but I will not go into that. The symbolism of the door. All that is so in the twenty second chapter of Psalm. And in the story of Solomon and Gomorrah, all that is recorded in Genesis in that. And there was a place for men only. That's what he brought out. A king to eat for men. And only men. And you're told in the 22nd Psalm that they were wicked. And the dogs surrounded me. And the wicked ones encircled me. So you'll know by the symbol of the dog who the wicked ones are. If you have a concordance and you look it up, I need not discuss it from the platform. You'll know exactly the kind of institution that it was. It's all part of the unfolding scripture. Now the third one, who is not here tonight, he said, I assume I am Jesus Christ. And that night as he slept, that I found myself in an enormous Amphitheater. Huge place. Crowded to the gospel. I was at the very base, the very bottom of it all. At the top, to you. And you address this enormous crowd. And you are asking all of us if we would, with you, affirm, I am Jesus Christ. And so all who would agree to it would rise. And only a few of us rose. I rose. Just a few rose. And then together, you let us, and you say, I am Jesus Christ. And only a few from this enormous crowd in this amphitheater. And then I will. Again, that is scripture, not quoting it. But that scripture, the sixth chapter of the book of John. There was the biggest crowd recorded in scripture. The five thousand. The two modern five, it's a big crowd. This from his description would be an enormous crowd. Now this is the book or the chapter of the entire Bible that you can name, if you want to give it a name, C Session. Where they heard the story the grand story of the gospel. And only a few could take it. And the majority couldn't take it. So they turned away never to walk with him again. For he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And they say, well, we know this man. We know his father Joseph. And we know his father and mother. And how does he say, I came down from heaven? Then he says, unless you eat the body and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. How could he say, unless we eat the body and drink the blood of the Son of Man? He calls himself the Son of Man, which is the Son of God. And he claims as Son of God, he is one with God, that I and my Father are one. How could this thing be? So they death never to walk with him again. And he turned to the few who remained, just the few, 
And he said, Will you also go away? And Peter answered, To whom would we go? You have the word of eternal life. We have believed, and we have come to know you are the Holy One of Israel. They first heard it, and heard it and believed it. And through belief they came to know that he is free tonight, to come to know the truth of the Word of God. They know these words are true. Tonight, anyone here familiar with these words, familiar with the Bible, has spoken. But when you are asleep, you are not rationalizing. These things spring like flowers coming out of a vine. You can't even see. When you are not rationalizing, think these things that simply spring into being based upon where you are in the unfolding tree of life. And so here, we believe it. Having believed it, we have come to know you are the Holy One of Israel. Now, how will we eat the body of Jesus Christ? I can have the biggest meal in the world. It's no earthly good to me unless I eat it. When I eat it, I assimilate what I can, and what I can't, I expel. I just expel it. But I must first eat it. Well, how would I eat the body of Jesus Christ? By simply assuming I am Jesus Christ. And all that Jesus Christ represents, as I read about it in Scripture, I assume I am He. I may not be able to assimilate all that I am told concerning Jesus Christ. What I cannot, I will eliminate. But I can start eating Him and drinking His blood by making it alive within me. As I do so, then he begins to unfold within me. I must eat his body to have life within me. I must drink his blood. And the eating and the drinking of this being is simply, I am me. We are told there is only one body, one spirit, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, through all, and in all. But if that is true, and I am taught to believe, and I am asked to say, our Father. He tells me, I am Father. If I am called upon to say, our Father, and then the one who teaches me to say, our Father, tells me, I am Father. When you see me, you see the Father. I am the Father. Well, then I assume I am He. If I assume I am He, and He is the Father, then all that is said of the Father, He is the only Spirit, the only body, should begin to unfold within me to the degree that I assimilate it, that I feast upon it and feed upon it. So here in a short order, three weeks, three men, all in their thirties to a tale, could actually assume the state, the point of revealing where they stand in Scripture. For the only reason for it all is to unfold God's Word. There's no other purpose. But if you own the entire world, and Scripture didn't begin to unfold it, what would it matter? For we are told the whole vast world is a breath. And all its splendor like a flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower falls. But the word of God endures forevermore. So this word endures forevermore. Therefore let it unfold within us. It unfolds as you dare to assume I am Christ. But now I warn And this is a warning given to us in the first chapter of the first epistle of Peter. If you invoke as far <laughs> him who judges each one impartially concern their deeds, then conduct yourselves with all through your entire life in exile. This is the exile. 
everyone wearing this veil of flesh is exiled from heaven. While you are here, when you dare to invoke as Father, Him who judges each one impartially according to their deeds. Well, then you judge your own. Don't think tonight with dirty hands, the unclean hands, all things, that you dare to invoke it because you're warned it's something what would happen. You are actually conjuring the power of the universe. But it's yourself. It's your very being. It is God. You are God. There is only God. There is nothing but God. God became as we are, that we may be as He is. For tonight, these three gentlemen, they didn't dare for one moment, or uh, they didn't for one moment think they were not worthy of such an association. And they claim, I am Jesus Christ. And they were rewarded with the most glorious vision of where they stand in Scripture. Scripture is unfolding in them. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. As it fulfills itself in me, that I awaken and I am So, the one who voices, who through his servants the prophets, we call it Scripture. For so tonight you can take it on this level, as he took it with the gospel. That's simply that. He realized after he did it, I hope there wasn't too much of a bet against his friend, unless he shares with the friend his knowledge of Christ. Next time he meets his friend, he can tell the friend what he did, and then encourage the friend to try this, so that he would actually begin to await. But I tell you, it works. It's something that cannot fail. If you will assume that you are the man, that you want to be. Now this other aspect of this great secret of a man was given to us by my friend who was here tonight. He went home and in a vision he was told quite vividly, he being the writer, he was the perfect medium through which it could come. That when you would have an other in your imagination, do for the other what you do when you write a play. And in writing a play, you play all the characters. So you assume all the characters, even in a love scene, you make love to self, to find out what this one would say, what this one would react to. And if in the love scene, a stab with a face is in order, you stab yourself. Then in playing all the parts, you know exactly how to unfold it. Well now, in doing so, now do the same thing for one you would help, when you would apply your imagination towards the other. So he went home, that is, that very next day, having received this revelation, he tried it out. And with what startling success. Then, the following week, he wrote me another letter where he warned me to warn you to do it always with love. For the first time he did it, he simply assumed that he was what he wanted to help. And her immediate need was a car. So he simply assumed he was driving, as this one, the new car with the top down and the wind blowing in her face. It was a woman. In the immediate presence, her mother gave her the sum of money to buy the car and justified the gift by saying, since she did not have a car, she has not been seeing her as often as she would like to see her. And so she gave the money so that when she had the car, then she'd pay more business to the mother. So the new car and its keys with the top down and the same make and the same color that he in his imagined state road. The identical make, the identical color, and the top down convertible. And that's the car she bought without knowing what this man did. Then with the new car, she said to him to get a certain body out of her life. But do it without a thing. Do it without hurting. He, on the other hand, when he once more assumed her body, he was locked in her body and couldn't get out. He just couldn't get out for six hours. 
And when he finally got out and disengaged himself from this association, he was so emotionally and mentally and physically exhausted, he fell asleep and slept for twelve unbroken hours. So, very nicely and wisely, he wrote me another letter asking me to tell you, who heard the first aspects of this wonderful working of the law, not to do it, save you do it in love. For you may be locked in that which you thought you would have helped, and got lost in something up to now, for God is done. And so if you do it in love, you can't go wrong. You will do it beautifully and you will disengage yourself as easily as going in and out of an open door. So that is on this level. On the highest level, you will know exactly where you stand this night, tomorrow night, if it doesn't come tonight, if you dare. I can't say that all of you be able to dare. My friends say to me, that the two cousins of his, raised as he was a Catholic, their thought was fascinating, it's all in the dream. And said he to himself, and he didn't want it to them, had I been told the same story of Jesus Christ a few years ago, I would have felt as you feel now. But he didn't criticize them. He knew how they felt, but he didn't tell them that he, a few years ago, would have thought the same thing. He thought it to himself. But now, having heard it, having applied it, and working on this level, he knew that this power was Jesus Christ, as told in Scripture. My friend, who told the story, he was actually quoting the 24th verse of the first chapter of First Corinthians, that the Spirit that is called Jesus Christ, that this is the power and the wisdom of God, personified as a man. But you're a man, aren't you? Well, the power is in you. It's being formed into the image of God. But that power operates through the agency of man. And when it's formed in you, so it's a perfect image of God. Well, that shell is broken, and you come out. But you still remain here in this world, playing your part until that moment in time when the veil is taken off, and it's taken off for the last time. Everyone will actually be incorporated into the one body. So I made it when I wrote it in that little tiny pamphlet of mine. He breaks the shell. That we are gathered one by one to be united into a single man who is God. What a shock to the whole vast world when my friends saw an enormous crowd, almost like a service, because were I at the top, and he at the bottom, it couldn't really be an arena, as he described it, this great amphitheater. How could it be? I should be down at the bottom, addressing the crowd. But here I was at the top, the apex, addressing this crowd almost like a great pyramid. And they were all seated and not a seat to be had. But only a few would rise, only a few had the courage to claim I am Christ. Three weeks ago when I made a statement, there was a chap here, he brought a family of seven, his wife and children and all. And he made a date to see me the following Tuesday. It was a Friday night that I made a statement. And he had a date to see me on Tuesday. That was made before the lecture. He not oh he did not keep the date. He hadn't told me, he hadn't written me, not a card. He, seven of them, all together who came, they were symbolic of the crowd who cannot take it. He had this concept of Jesus Christ as some being who lived and died 2,000 years ago. And hope to see him come in some strange way, may, may be a glorified man, but he wants to see a little man all glorified with life to save his world. That's not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. <coughs> Very in every child born of woman. And everyone has to go through the same unfolding word of God. That remains forever. 
Nations come and go. Empires come and their fall. Everything comes and goes. And with us just like the grass and fall like the flower. But the word of God, which is the gospel, the story of the gospel, remains forever. It unfolds in the individual. And so, practice the law on this level, that you will become familiar with it and have faith in Jesus Christ, who is the power and the wisdom of God. So you start on this level. And then, that something begins to unfold within you. And it unfolds in the automatic, involuntary manner, in the form of a dream or a vision. You go back and you search the Bible, <coughs> and you find in Scripture the passage that you have experienced. And you're exactly where you stand in the unfolding drama. You come to the end of Revelation when you stand in the presence of infinite love that is God, the risen Christ. To incorporate it. And then you go through telling your story as best you can of the risen Christ, whether the believer or not to tell it. Then you come to the grand series of events, and they are eight. There are eight. And eight is a symbol of the complete resurrection. And you start with the crucifixion. If we have been united with him in a death like him, we should certainly be united with him in a resurrection like him. What's the distinction in him? We have been united with him in a death like him. We shall be united with him in a resurrection like him. So here, that's the beginning of it all. We all have been united with God. He chose us in himself before the world was. So all are crucified with him. All is crucified under his arm. This is the cross. The next is the entombment. That's the second. <laughs> and you are entombed within your own skull. That's where you're entombed. That is Golgotha. That's the great sepulchre where Jesus Christ is back. <laughs> the third is the resurrection. On the third day, the third came up out of the earth. Out of the deep, the earth came. So three is a symbol or a number of resurrection as eight is. Eight is the grand one. So on the third day, you resurrect. You awaken within your skull to find yourself in two. And then you come out. And the coming out, the symbol of your birth from above, is present in the form of a little infant that in part of That's number four. Number five, the discovery of David. You find David. And David is the son of God. Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And you find him, and he calls you father. Then and only then you know who you really are. It's only God in this world. And you know, even though you're limited by the flesh, you're exactly who you are. But while you wear it, it's like a grand piano who could sit at the greatest instrument in the world. If you put a mid upon it, what would he do with the instrument? The greatest technician in the world, seating down at any grand piano that is beautifully tuned, everything is perfect, and he is the master master, but covering with a mid and asking to play. So this is the mid that covers God. This is the veil. And so you find David, and you find him on the inside of your own being. And he calls you father, and you know who you are. And here is a wonderful being that he feels you as God the Father. So that is the fifth. And then the sixth is the tearing of the curtain of the temple, which is your own body, from top to bottom, and severing you in two. And at the base, of that pine of yours, the blood of God, the golden liquid living life, and you know it is yourself. You fuse with it, this is the seven, and up to go in certain times form, all over the scripture. And then the eighth is the seal, 
of the Holy Spirit upon you. Father, the saints of the devil, and you do exactly what you're told in Scripture. When the devil returns to the ark, he puts out his hand and takes the devil in, and the devil comes into the ark to him. And that is the seal of God's word. And so the devil does come, which is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, and seals you forever. And you are sealed to an inheritance that is imperishable. And you still wear the gloves, you still wear the veil, until your time comes at the end of a very short interval. When you take it off and the world falls in sin. And then for that first moment in eternity, you immediately have returned to eternal life. So here, the greatest of all the blessings is simply a strong imagination, a clear, wonderful idea, and an eternal vision of things as you would like them to be, completely fixed in your mind. And you can start from this level up. And I tell you, the story of the Gospel is the idea fixed in the mind of God for you. He will not waver. He will not falter. But on this level, while we are veiled as we are and shut up, we can play and push in our world and make it a lovely world for ourselves and for our friends. Just as our friend did this for himself on the golf course, he can do it for another. He can do it for anyone in this world. You can take anyone that you love in this world and you should thank him and you really make him love all. But it's all one anyway. And you will take one who cannot do for themselves what they want to do. And you will wear them as though you were the other. And you will give to yourself what they could not give to themselves. And they will get it. And things will break for Lovely things, not things that you imagine. Not something that you plotted and planned. Out of the nowhere, the whole thing will simply work for them. When it works for them, you will have the satisfaction of knowing that you use God's law wisely. And to use God's law wisely is always to use it lovingly. Whenever you use your imagination lovingly on behalf of another, you actually mediate God to that other. And then the whole thing unfolds within the world. So in the end, not one is greater than the other, because all, everyone is God. So in the end, you can truly say, as we're told in Ephesians, there is only one body, one spirit. One God and Father of us all, who is above all, through all, in all, only one. For I stood in the presence of the one, incorporated into that one without loss of identity. So I know I am that body, the body of the risen Christ. And I tell you, God is man. So when Blake made the statement, there are the man. God is no more. Thy own humanity learn to adore. Mankind is so difficult to believe that the infinite being is man. And it is man. We are the fragmented man. But all of these gather together, one by one by one, to be united into a single man who is God. Now let us go into the silence. How often you return to the same state? Well, it becomes constant, really. It's like going home tonight. You always return to the same place where you live, really. And that place to which one will constantly return constitutes their dwelling place. So if you return night after night to the feeling of being wanted, being secure, being whatever you want in this world, that becomes a normal, natural dwelling place. So if you can actually make it tonight natural, you'll find yourself returning through the day to the feeling of being wanted or being happy or being whatever you want. So I can say you can number it once, twice, mm -hmm. twice or what not. This is how you have to use to make it natural. When it becomes natural, so that the mind returns their function, that's your right thing. As we're told in Scripture, where you dwell, they ask you.
come and see. Where am I dwelling? Well, I dwell where ever I most confidently be turned in my imagination. If in the course of a day someone is faced with a problem, they find themselves thinking all day long on that problem, that's where they're dwelling, though they go to the wall of the story. The body is there, but they're not dwelling there. So where is a man dwelling? Tonight we have in our world many persons, many who are dwelling in some wonderful neighborhood with outward appearances of dignity and security, but they know what they've done, and they know that the Huns are up them. And so they're dwelling where they know the Huns is going to find them, in Belgium. You find it every day. You and I only get one little paper on the West Coast, but they are thousands of the papers across the country. In every little hamlet you find names who are prominent to the eyes of the world, in their environment, who are dwelling where they know what they've done. And they know that the Huns are against them, or coming for them. You find it every night, you read the best carefully. So, where are you dwelling? You can dwell this night, I ask everyone to dwell this night, in the house of Jesus Christ. Say, I am Jesus Christ. You may not be familiar with all that he taught, and all that is said of him in scripture, for the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. The entire Old Testament writes only about Jesus Christ, and the new fulfills it. So if you just simply say, I am He, and try to feel it, the other person would feel embarrassed to feel it, and be that blasphemy. And others wouldn't dare, they wouldn't want it. I had a friend of mine, a very successful playwright, he had, I think, three very successful Broadway plays. I know one ran over a year. And he and I would always discuss this. And he said, no, I have time for that. I'm afraid of it. Well, just about two years ago, he was watching TV. He got up to go to the bathroom and fell. He was gone. He is still waiting for he was there as soon as he thought the flesh box was far more attractive. That flesh to him was such a marvelous thing in this world. And he's, well, he's ten years my senior. He still was living in the dream of that sort of thing in this world. Well, he's now clothed in another garment, playing a part based upon what he needs, for God is infinite compassion. But he had the chance there to dare to step out of that level and to assume that which is infinitely greater than what he thought was great in this world. He thought it great. So I wouldn't force anyone beyond where they are, right? Leave them as they are. You can expose the thought to them and let them either take it or not take it. Any other questions? So if there are any, we are here every Tuesday.